From the Hype HQ studio in Chicago, Illinois, it's Startup Hype Man, the podcast. Hello, everyone. My name is Raj Nation, and I am the founder of Startup Hype Man. Fast-growing startups work with me because they want to become better storytellers. Whether that's for customers, investors, or a packed audience, they know that story is their ticket to stand out, stand apart, and change the game. And this podcast here is where I talk with entrepreneurs and leaders in the startup ecosystem, ranging from scale stage to early stage, as they share specific strategies that they have executed to stand out across three specific areas, sales, marketing, and people. Before we begin today's episode, remember you can head to StartupHypeMan.com and subscribe to the newsletter that doesn't suck. You'll get new podcast episodes and timely reads written by me, but also helpful articles from around the web and a notice of upcoming pitch competitions. All right, let's dive in and hear how today's guest is changing the game. Ladies and gentlemen, making her way to the microphone from Chicago, Illinois, and currently residing in Chicago, Illinois. She is the president at Sales Assembly. Please welcome Christina, she ain't shady, Brady. Uh, Yes, best rhyme ever. I'm gonna put it on a bumper sticker. (laughs) Wonderful, (laughs) thanks for having me. Of course. I'm happy to have you here. Like I said, everybody, she is Christina Brady, president of Sales Assembly. What is Sales Assembly? They're an organization I got a lot of love for. They are the tech industry. Well, not just the tech industry, really the the sales, the, the revenue industries only scale as a service platform. They are the trusted partner for leading B2B technology companies to help them scale better, scale faster, and scale smarter. And they do that through training, enablement, development, certification programs, all the things a company might need, all the things individuals at your company might need to grow in their career, therefore helping your company grow overall. Sales Assembly has built up an amazing membership over the years with some of the leaders in the game like Gong, like Zendesk, ShipBob, Outreach, G2. These are all different companies who are members of Sales Assembly, which means if you're not a member and you're listening to this, might want to become a member. Now, all of that gushing aside, I'm really excited to have Christina here today on the podcast because we're talking about something that it's actually, I think you're working on pretty closely in one of your certification programs, which is turning an SDR into a successful account executive. Christina, once again, welcome. Why is this on your mind and why is this important to you? I think one, thank you. Um, I I love this. So to be here. And this is one of the topics that is extremely close to my heart because on a broader scale, uh, it's about career development. It's about planning for your future. And when done properly, um, it's a multiple win situation. It's a win for the individual because they have something to aim toward every single day. And when you have a target that you're going for, and it's tied to your well-being and tied to your life and tied to your self-worth on your very worst days, you're going to get out of bed and you're going to do it because there is a bigger picture. So it helps people to think more broadly around just their own life improvement. And then for the company as well, if you can properly career path your employees, you have longer retention, you're going to grow more year over year, you're going to have a positive culture and company positive cultures and positive employee morale tend to be in the top 10% of revenue producing companies overall. So this stuff matters. And so honing in on SDR to AE or SDR EDR to AM, I think not enough people focus enough on how to do that properly. It just feels like a given, like yeah, I'm, I'm an SDR or BDR. And so naturally I'm going to be an AE and we just kind of let that happen. But like all things, um, being deliberate about it is helpful for everyone. So I'm excited to talk about this. And I'm excited as well. We're going to dive into all of that more. But before we do, let's learn a little bit more about you, Christina. Now, I, I'm going to preface this by saying by asking this question, I'm pretty sure it could become its own podcast episode. Uh, but <laughs> I, I'm literally just going to, I'm going to give you the platform here. Thoughts on Peloton. Go. Okay. Well, that could be its own episode. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Thoughts on Peloton are amazing. I will keep it brief. I don't like to work out in front of other people. And prior to Peloton, I don't like to work out like at all. Like I've accepted the fact that I'm an ugly exerciser. Like my 
my body does weird things. My face does weird things. And I don't want to like do those things in front of other people. Uh, and I'm too self-conscious. And so finding the Peloton bike and the tread, um, it actually turned me into an athlete in the last two and a half years. I've lost 84 pounds. I now enjoy working out. Um, I feel like I have more energy uh, and I feel better in my own skin. And I think regardless of your size or what you look like, it's, it's feeling good in this sack of muscle and bones that we're stuck in that's important. And so for me, uh, Peloton got me with their marketing. So I'm, I'm an avid believer. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's kind of funny that you talked about all that stuff about Peloton. In my head, I'm like, well, they should just make the commercial like you just talking into the camera because you just <laughs> sold it for everyone right there. If Peloton wants to pay me to sell bikes, I will be their top salesperson. And I think I've referred, I've referred 17 people in two years to getting bikes. So now it's, now it's a mission. But for me, it's just, it's the platform that does it for me. But yeah, Peloton, hit me up. <laughs> Peloton tattoo is probably next up on, on your list of, of to-do items. Oh God, no. Oh God, no. Because then you <laughs> jinx it, right? Like the minute you get a tattoo, oh, then right. it's like... Yeah. Turns out Peloton is doing some weird stuff. And I'm yeah, like, damn it, now yeah. they're on Turns my body. Turns out they're like, maiming baby koalas. Right, just cause, you know, to like <laughs> make their wheels or something, you know, and I'm like, no, no, no. So I don't want to jinx them. Maybe a temp tattoo. <laughs> All right, well, let's talk about life pre-Peloton for a second. Um, I'm curious to know, what was your first job, whether like real or like your parents assigned you a job and paid you for things? Um, what was your first job and what did you get out of it? Well, my first job, so it was when I was, I was 14 and when I was younger, so I come from a family that was, is heavily in the arts. Uh, and so one of the things that I leaned into is I loved painting. I loved building. Um, I loved very, very detail oriented artwork. Like it was something that oh, like for my entire life, I've loved it. And so I was in art classes when I was um, 14 and got to the point where it got too expensive for, um, for us to afford. And so my mom made a deal with the owner of the studio that in exchange for my classes, I would do like secretarial work for them. Mm. Um, and so at 14, like that was my first job is um, four days a week after school, I would be behind the counter answering calls and organizing things. And in exchange, I was able to continue getting my art lessons. So that was my first job. And I think what it, what it taught me was, was honestly just, you know, earning what you want. Um, and it taught me kind of creativity. Um, so it was the first time that I said, okay, wait, so if I put in this work and I do this thing, then I get the outcome that I want. And so it's, it's not heard of to think that I wound up with a career in sales and in a career in revenue and a career in leadership, because that's exactly what sales is. You, you, you get out what you put in. So that, that was my first lesson, the tender age of 14. Well, then my follow-up question then is, what was your first like true sales gig? And I don't necessarily mean like, I know you've worked at Groupon. I don't necessarily mean like Groupon. I mean like you like sold anything to anyone else. <laughs> well, it's a little bit of a dual answer. So what I'm going to say in terms of like, I actually like sold something is right out of college. So 2007, 2008, in the last recession, um, I started working at MetLife due to some hardship in my family. I needed to, to make some money. And, you know, insurance companies at that time were recruiting kids out of college like crazy. And they were like, we have this incredible opportunity where you have no guaranteed income. And would you like to take that opportunity? And I was like, yeah, I would love that. <laughs> I, would, I would love to have no financial stability whatsoever. Let's do it. What an adventure. Um, um, you know, and, and it was like, hey, take these tests and get these licenses and then and then you can sell insurance and you can be a financial planner. And so lucky them, I'm a good test taker. So I got my life health auto 663-22, and I was able to be a full financial planner, which really was just selling people on financial products and plans and insurance. And so that was probably the first time that I actively had to say, like, okay, I have a sale process and I'm like selling something to someone. The uh, only difference with insurance is like, nobody wanted it, you know, like people need it, but like you're selling something. Nobody's like, yeah, like today I'm going to have someone sell me insurance and I can't wait, you know? So that's, it's a good way to cut your teeth. Yeah. That's, that's interesting. So given that, that you had that experience, what is, let me think about how to ask this. What's one thing that coming out of that, you're like, wow, I never imagined I would have learned blank. 
Uh, to me, it was um, the heart behind the sale. So I realized very quickly that the motivation of the salesperson and the motivation of the buyer has to be the same, which is we are going to help and we are going to improve our quality of life, way of life, or way in which we do things. Or at least for me, I can't do it. Um, and in insurance, in at least in the setup that I had where I was working there with it being commission only, it was, I want to sell the product that makes me the most commission first and helps the customer the most second. Um, and I found myself in a situation where I was talking to somebody who was very, very much in need of some real financial guidance and they were in pretty bad shape. And um, I kept having to check myself by saying, well, I could sell them this product and that would make more money, but this one's actually better for them. So my motivation was to sell the product that makes me more because I have no guaranteed income. Like my, mm -hmm. my stability was coming into play, but then it also greatly impacted their stability. Um, and that was actually, that was the, my second to last day as a financial planner, that that moment hit me like a ton of bricks, which is if I can't do this responsibly and I can't do this in a way that is going to meaningfully impact in the right way, the person I'm selling to, then like, I can't, because I have to be able to sleep at night. So the lesson for me was if you are going to be in sales um, or you're going to be in any kind of a revenue organization, you have to be 100% behind and passionate that what you are doing is truly the right thing for people. Like you have to want to help first. And like you have to, and you have to check that. Um, and I don't think everyone does that. And so for me, that moment has stuck with me for 15 years. That's actually how I left my first employer, actually my first and only outside employer was I fell out of love with the product and I realized yeah. before going into meetings, I had to like make myself smile and like convince myself of the product before I could even talk to them. And when it got to that point, I was like, I cannot, your point about selling with heart, like, it's like, I can't push this to people if my heart is not in it. Right. Right. And then it's just bad. And then you feel like a bad person. And maybe if you keep doing it in a sense and you're doing things that you know aren't good for people, then maybe you are a bad person. You know, it's like your, your mind starts to go there. And so it's like, no, I want to be a good person. Like I, I, I want to leave my mark on the world. And, and how am I going to do that? And for me, yeah. selling that product, that, that wasn't the way, but, but I knew I wanted to find a way. So also, I should point out the irony in your case of selling essentially financial stability to someone else when your own financial stability, it's not even like, it's like on the line in the process. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. It, it let's, so, so, yeah. so things advance, right? Um, and you get involved with uh, on the rise organization sales assembly back in around mid middle of 2020. Um, and, and yeah, maybe even a little bit before that, but how did you first learn of sales assembly and how did you get involved? And maybe you could even give a little bit more or a better description than what I gave up front of what sales assembly really is. Yeah, well, you did a great job. Um, and so I, you know, I'll put, I'll put sprinkles on it, but essentially when I was um, working at Glassdoor and a head of sales capacity for their growth teams, Glassdoor was then and still is a member of sales assembly. Uh, and one day, about two and a half, three years ago, um, I was tapped by my VP of sales to say, hey, we are members of Sales Assembly. They are looking for people who are wanting to coach other leaders in some of their sessions. And that had always been a passion of mine. Like, I love working with leaders and I love working with executive leaders because I think companies are built on their leadership. So my impact for companies is I'm going to come in and I'm going to get your leaders in. That's what I truly love to do. Um, and so I was like, yes, I would love this opportunity. So I started leading some of the new manager trainings for sales assembly as a, uh, uh, as an employee of theirs and as a member of sales assembly. Um, and additionally, sales assembly played a large role in the training and up-leveling of my team, my reps, the supporting functionality of the business. And then even as a leader, the ability to have this resource where I can get strategy and not have to like pay $90,000 for it. Um, that's pretty cool because advice in tech is one of the most expensive things right now. Like advice in mm -hmm. tech is expensive and that's crazy. And that's kind of the thing that we are looking to break or improve. Um, and so COVID hit and uh, I got laid off 
or along with 400 other of my colleagues um, in the Chicago office, which was tough. And um, I had this incredible relationship with Sales Assembly and Matt and Jeff, if, if you don't know them, they are wonderful individuals. They are now close friends and partners of mine. Um, but I called up Matt and I was supposed to lead a new manager training two days after getting laid off. And I called him up and I said, so like, this isn't public yet. Yet again, the irony um, strikes. <laughs> Right. I was like, I just got laid off. So how do you feel about unemployed, crazy redheaded lady coming in and just like telling people how to be great leaders? And and Matt was like, I mean, obviously we would still love for you to come because you're still you. He's like, but let's figure out if we can help you land somewhere. Um, and throughout the process of finding a new role through COVID, um, I had a couple of different offers on the table with incredible companies. And I called Matt back up because at this point I was like, Matt, whether you like it or not, like you're my advisor in this. So you're going to help me. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> you know, all these companies, which, where do I go? What do I do? And he goes, well, before, before you actually make any decisions, we have an idea to run by you. Um, come join sales assembly, be the head of our product, be one of our thought leaders and like pour jet fuel on this thing and do what you would have done for any of these companies and any one of these companies leadership and do it for all of our members and just like, like make that much larger impact. And it was probably the biggest no brainer of my life. And it was a tough decision because it's, it's a smaller company, a smaller internal team. I'm used to big tech and the problems with big tech. Mm -hmm. um, but I jumped at it and that was, that was almost 10 months ago. And uh, I haven't looked back since it's been an incredible opportunity and I love it. So. Well, and it's been evident in the fact that the product has scaled. I think the, the offering has scaled and you, and the company overall I, I think it was always good, but it just kind of feels more put together. You know? And I mean that in the nicest way possible. Well, thanks. I mean, I, you know, that's, <laughs> uh, that, that was kind of the idea was we were ready for the next step. In fact, my, my second week as president, we did our national launch, which wound up being a little bit of a global launch. We have members now from California to New York, to Texas, to Dublin, to Brazil, to Toronto. We, it's, it, and, but it, it was like my second week and they were like, so by the way, we're doing a global launch. I was like, oh, okay. Um, That's right. I guess. Actually, it's funny because <laughs> yeah. it's funny. I think not too long ago, like literally a year ago, it was just Chicago slash the Midwest's community. Right. Right. Um, and, and I mean, like, like wildfire, we found a way to say like, hey, what we do isn't specific to Chicago and we need to think broader. And so I think even as the world comes back to the new normal, what we have learned in our ability to impact B2B tech, um, in some cases across the globe, still applies and we'll probably wind up landing somewhere in a hybrid where you're probably mm -hmm. going to see me on the road a lot, <laughs> you yeah. know, and going to different cities, but, but also having virtual trainings because they are more efficient and you can learn more and you can learn faster. So we're going to kind of find that ideal blend. So I'm, I'm excited for the future. Let's dive into today's main topic, which again is turning an SDR into a successful AE or account manager, right? Or, or BDR and all, all this different acronyms, which all mean the same thing. Turning the person who tries to book meetings into the person who takes the meetings and makes the sale. Um, yeah. So let's talk about that SDR role in the first place. What would you say from your experience what are the qualities of a successful SDR? And I don't necessarily mean like what metrics are they hitting? I mean, like, what is that person like? Like, what is their motivation and, and what's the makeup of them? It can be broad because buyers are broad. And so I think we often have this idea that in order to fit into a certain person, you have to be a certain way, but really we're selling to people and people are all different. So the first thing I would say is the ability to be flexible understand your communication style and your behavioral patterns and be able to recognize that in others and amend yours to mirror when necessary. Mm. So it's like, you can have whatever qualities you want. You can be whoever you want to be like, let your flag fly, but be able to acknowledge when you're hearing something different and pick up on it because it's your job to make that buyer or that prospect feel comfortable. So that sort of flexibility and sense of self. So I guess we could call that self-awareness. Um, and the second piece of it is, I don't think anybody should expect most SDRs to be in the role and on day one, know exactly what they want to do. Like, 
candidly, most SDRs wind up in that role because they are either newer to the industry, they're newer to sales, they've just graduated, um, and they think that this is a great way to get an introduction to a company. Like SDR is an easy point of entry. And you have some that are like, I think I want sales and others that are like, I don't really want sales. Like I would love to actually be in IT, but like they're hiring for an SDR. So I guess I'm going to be an SDR. So the other thing is someone's ability to not know what they want to do today, but to be able to use the experience they have every day on the floor and interacting with the customers and the product to be able to determine within six months to a year, where am I going to navigate my own path? So am I a trailblazer? Am I a self-starter? Am I able to set goals for myself? Am I able to recognize what I'm passionate about versus what I need and be able to identify, yes, this is the job I want to be in and I want to advance in sales or success or support or No, I don't want to continue to be in sales, but I've actually identified that I would love to be in ops, like put me on deals desk. So you also need that person who's able to be introspective and understand exactly what their next step should be. So it's kind of that, we'll call it professional flexibility. So that actually brings up an interesting, like almost more philosophical question is traditionally the SDR slash BDR is seen as an entry level position. But they have a lot of responsibility, right? Like they're, they drive pipeline for a company. Without them, there's, there's no pipeline generation. And as someone who used to be a full cycle AE, I know how easy it is to just not do your job of prospecting once you have like two, me- two deals in your pipeline. So <laughs> philosophically, <Same. laughs> right? Like, right? yeah, see, you've, you've lived that life. So like um, yeah. knowing how important that position is, is it fair to treat that as an entry-level role and for a company to be compensating it as an entry-level role? I think BDRs and SDRs have one of the hardest jobs Um, because the emotion behind the job and what you have to do on a day-to-day basis and then how quickly you get through that, it is drinking out of a fire hose. Um, It is hard to pick up the phone and send a lot of emails and deal with the amount of rejection that they do. And then additionally, that payoff isn't always there, right? The payoff is like, I got the meeting, but then if the deal doesn't close, then it's almost like somebody took your payoff from you, you know? So it's like, you're expected to sort of take hit after hit after hit and just like find a way to get through and find a way to get better. BDR, SDR, that position to me is designed to be temporary. It is designed to teach you what you need to know to get into the next seat or to help you identify where that next seat is. So I think it's entry level in a sense of it is helping me set the stage for what my next step looks like. But in terms of how hard that job is and the amount of organization you have to have and time management and flat out tenacity, those same skills, you have to hold them like all the way through your career. So in that sense, it's not entry level. It's not entry level in the sense that it's easy. Think of it as entry to your career Mm. versus like, oh, these, you know, I hear people all the time talk about BDRs. They're like, oh, these youngins or like these kids. And like, it bothers me because it's like, they're doing a really, really hard job and they're doing a really, really critical job. And if instead of looking at them like they were low men on the totem pole and said, looking at them like they're the foundation that you're building a house on, that's a lot different. It's a different way to look at it. So I, I would agree with you that the way you view it is really important. Okay, so then that, that uh, that's an interesting take that you say it's like it's a it's a design to be a temporary position, right? And I hadn't really thought about that before, but that is that is pretty poignant. Um, what we like when we think about transitioning out of that role, then because it is designed to be temporary, the default is okay. Well, you're an SDR, so your natural next step is to become an exa- like you you're the person who books the meeting. The natural next step is to become the person who takes the meetings. And there's definitely a Seinfeld episode joke in the back of my head with all this, but I'll refrain from going through that. My question is, is it an automatic transition? And is it fair for companies to be saying, this is the path? You go from SDR to AE. Yeah. Not always. Um, I also view SDR, BDR and their core functionality to be very, very different and like what they should be learning. So a lot of people look too simplistically at the BDR, SDR role, which is you're a meeting setter. Like your job is to prospect, your job is to cold call, your job is to be a meeting setter. So then in that sense, if you look at it simplistically like that, then like, yeah, I guess your next job would be to take the meetings. 
But that also doesn't really make linear or directional sense because what your job should be as an SDR is you should be an expert at qualifying prospects. You should become an expert in understanding the upfront objections and the barriers to entry for your product and your company. You should be an expert in understanding the psychology of how to get through a gatekeeper, how to get an executive engaged in conversation. And the way in which you prove that, so like the prove it is, I got a meeting. But it's not just, I got a meeting. It's, I got a meeting with a qualified prospect with the right person who has budget to buy with a company who is an incredible fit for our product. And when you look at it from that end, the natural step could be account executive, could also be account manager, right? Like those skills are transferable anywhere. It could also be leading into product. Can you just define account manager versus account executive? Oh my gosh. Well, that in and of itself, we, we should do another episode. So the nomenclature <laughs> of roles is like crazy, I but, but I think it's, it's, I think I'm in three separate categories. So account executive is purely hunter, new business sales. The logo has not purchased with you before or hasn't purchased with you in a certain amount of time, right? So we're looking at that as new business. Um, typically account manager, client success manager, and growth sales rep can be all the same thing or all interchangeable. So you're thinking of growth sales. I am responsible for upsell, cross-sell, and or renewal. Client success, I am responsible for customer lifecycle management. But some account managers are responsible for all of those things. And some client success reps are responsible for all of those things. Mm -hmm. So really, however you find your customer lifecycle management, elements of what you're learning as a BDR are applicable, whether you're doing new business sales, growth sales, or customer lifecycle management. Okay. All right. So that's the difference between AM and AE. And you're saying it's possible this SDR doesn't have to go straight to, doesn't have to slide over to AE. In fact, they could be the person who's taking the customer after they've purchased and getting them to invest more in the company. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because if your job is qualifying deals and your job is qualifying prospects, then you're going to be a great growth seller because you're going to be able to learn the skills you need as an SDR to identify when there is more money to spend. You're going to know how to get through the line of business that has the budget that you need. You're going to know how to look out for triggers for when you should be contacting them. Um, Also, BDRs get objections like crazy all day long, like all they get are objections and all they get are being put off. Well, even if they're an existing customer, anybody who is in a client success role knows you get objections from existing customers as well. And they're not always prepared for it. Some of my strongest account managers that I would hire when I was head of sales for growth at Glassdoor came from the SDR team, like some of my strongest. And it's because they came in with that tenacity of like, oh yeah, I'll get to who I need to talk to. I'm going to be persistent. I don't think this is the right product fit for them. They had that innate knowledge because they were SDR and they had to prove it first. So right. I think they can be dynamite AMs. This actually opens up an interesting thought. I hadn't considered this before, but you talk about how good they are at essentially being the objection defense person. Is it safe to say, or fair to say rather, that you could groom an SDR to actually become a product marketer because product marketer's job is built around understanding market objections and speaking to those things. Uh, Yeah. Like now we're talking, now we're getting snappy. Like if you view your SDR seat as an introductory role to one of your revenue roles, I would be it would be tough to see any role in your revenue organization that couldn't benefit from being in that role. Mm -hmm. Revenue operations could benefit from being in the role. Product could benefit from being in the role. Marketing could benefit. Even IT could benefit from being in the role of SDR and actually talking to customers, identifying who they are, applying the product to it and figuring out what are people objecting to upfront that now I, as a marketer, I can solve that. Like I find a way with our marketing and our product to amend it so that our SDRs aren't hitting that objection anymore. And I know they're getting that objection because I spent a year as an SDR at this company. So it can be another way to be an entry point to any of your revenue roles and make any of them stronger by having that firsthand knowledge and training. I like that a lot. Now, for purpose of today's conversation and you know, not pulling the wool over people's eyes, we're talking about sliding into the AE role. And I think because that's kind of the industry standard, though we have made a good case for why it should not automatically be the standard. Now, for those companies who are operating in this way or who do see a clear path for their SDR to go to an AE, what in your experience does a typical onboarding or ramp up look like? And what's your take on how it's typically done? 
I would say it's typically for companies that actually have a deliberate onboarding or training. And I say for companies too, because a lot of them don't. Mm -hmm. A lot of them rely on the fact that all the training that you need to be in AE is going to happen when you're in SDR. And then once you're in the seat, we'll train you for whatever else you need. So they, they, they allow the role to be the training, which I think can be a big mistake. Um, for those that do have in place, a lot of it could look like call shadowing, look like attending trainings, um, and just a lot of like peer-to-peer -peer mentorship. Like there is very rarely a comprehensive, like here's the plan to get our BDRs up to AE. And I think the biggest miss that we have is call shadowing is great. Like that should be a part of it. You should have your SDRs if the path is they're going to AE. And like in um, many cases it, it can, and it should. Um, listening to shadowing of prospect calls or demo calls is helpful but it's like a half the pie and we want the other half of the pie. And the other half of the pie is you can be a dynamite new business seller. If you have intimate knowledge of what goes wrong after they buy, because now you can address that and all those objections up front. So I often say to prepare your SDRs or BDRs, have them listen to win back conversations, have them listen to upset customer conversations, have them scroll your NPS feed and pick some customers who left really nasty remarks and reach out to them and talk to them about their experience and ask them, what could we have done when you purchased to make this a better experience for you? One, that's great for the customer, but two, now they know when I'm selling this product, I now know what I have to address up front so that they not only buy, maybe they buy more, but also they're sticky. Like I'm thinking about logo retention. Every company wants account executives who have logo retention in mind and not just the first deal. Right. So there's a much more comprehensive way that you can use them that helps everybody. So it sounds like if I'm here understanding that correctly, what you're advocating for is that, well, first off, most companies are kind of treating this as like, well, listen back to some stuff and right. that's your training. Like simulation is essentially your training. And what you're advocating for is simulation plus live interactive experience with actual people who could be realistic customers for the company and get them to like win a customer for you. Absolutely. It's, it's the nothing to lose bucket because if they're reaching out with the intention to help and the intention to understand, the worst thing that a no customer can give you is like another no. You know, like it's, it, you know, at that point, it's like, these are customers we have. We haven't won them back yet. We have made several attempts. They're unhappy. And every unhappy customer is like a bullet in your brand. You never know when they're going to come back to bite you. So if you have this resource at an SDR who wants to get better, have them come from the standpoint of I'm on the same side of the table as this customer. And like my job is to understand what went wrong. How can we help? How would we be able to regain your business? What would we need to do? If you turn that customer around, like that's amazing. What an incredible win and morale boost for them. But even if not, I just learned something crucial about my process and what I'm going to build in when I am an AE. Like none of my customers are going to have that feedback because I'm going to find a way to avoid it and build it into my process. So it just makes you more comprehensive and it makes you more strategic as an account executive from the first day in the seat. I like where you're going with this. And I want to ask you about how companies can kind of formalize these processes. But before I ask that, um, I just want to take a moment here and showcase a startup hype man portfolio company. Um, all this season, what we're doing is showcasing the elevator pitches that we've developed with different companies out there in the tech land and whatever you want to call it land. Uh, and so uh, today I want to focus on a company called Engagedly, um, which is an HR tech company. Uh, and this is the elevator pitch we've created using our signature k -Pasa pitch formula. And so if, you know, the reason why Engagedly matters for HR leaders is pretty simple. Engagedly is talking, is out there every day talking to HR leaders who are telling them like, hey, we are buried in our spreadsheets. We are buried in our paper documents that are trying to track our goals, our OKRs, our engagement. And what's happening is that's creating a trickle-down effect of missteps in their processes, having to chase managers for approval, and reviews, like reviews of your employees just being totally subjective. And it was at least partially tolerable before, but in a remote environment, it feels impossible. And as you think about transitioning back to a hybrid or a fully back to office environment, it doesn't seem sustainable. Well, that's where Engagedly comes in, helping HR leaders streamline and take ownership of their processes, regardless of the physical environment. 
companies are using Engagedly for company-wide people enablement. So that means all of performance management lives in one place with no missteps, no hunting down managers, no subjective reviews, you name it. HR leaders love it because they're not buried anymore. But more importantly, at an organization level, performance turns into something that happens for team members instead of happening to team members. You can learn more about this and get started in your people enablement journey by taking a demo at engagedly.com. Today, we're talking with Christina Brady, president of Sales Assembly, and the, t- the core topic is turning an SDR into a successful account executive. So Christina, what you talked about right before the break there was this notion of simulation plus live, real, interactive uh, scenarios where you try to get a, try and get a win back customer, things like that. Um, so I see how that works like practically, like, hey, you know, person who, who's going to go into this role, here's a list of companies, grab a couple and, and see if you can win them back. What kind of structure needs to be in place there? Because you can't just like say, like, go wild and somehow find us a customer, right? No, it doesn't work. Yeah, um, definitely. I, I would go so far as to say with any sales team, the, the concept of go wild, um, like fun, but careful. Um the process around that would say first is managed within your CRM. So if this becomes a part of your onboarding and your ramp, then one, make sure you're talking about it when you're hiring people, because the reason I'm saying this caveat is if you start to mention that part of your ramp from SDR to AE is having to go through this exercise, watch how people react to that. See if they feel good about getting into like getting their hands dirty or if they're like, Ooh, yikes, I don't want to do that because then you're sort of stress testing for is sales the right thing for you? Because difficult conversations are a part of it. So the first thing I would say is, let's talk about what your career pathing could look like and the support that we'll provide as you're moving up, because you can gauge if they are, in fact, the right seat for that SDR to eventually move to an AE before you even hire them. The second piece of it is to operationalize that, it could be as easy as creating what you call a winback book. And so all of the accounts in your CRM that are winbacks that your account executives or account executive leaders have identified, these are dead accounts, we are not able to win them back. You put those into a book and every time you have a new hire, you take a slice of that book, you assign it to the SDR when they are ready to be promoted to an account executive, and you give them a certain amount of time with a little bit of process to be able to go and see if they can win back those customers. Um, So that's kind of the win back strategy. Um, Additionally, you want to partner very closely with your account management or your client success team to be involved in the ramp. Because remember, even if you have an SDR that is moving to AE, listening to existing customer conversations, sitting in on a QBR, hearing a customer talk about what's not working or why they don't want to renew is going to make them a better AE on the front end. So have a partnership in process with your account management, your client success team, so that they know when the SDRs are ready to bump up, you have specific mentors that they can go to that will bring them on their calls and let them listen in kind of live. So those are like, for purposes of this conversation, probably the two easiest places to start. How about um, in like training them up on like processes? Right. Uh, mm-hmm. In terms of, hey, here's here's how we like to run our discovery or our demo calls. And I know a lot of times SDRs are like sitting and listening to those calls just as an SDR themselves, like the lead they're they're sitting in on that call. Um, but I don't think it's as easy as well. I you know I, I sat in on a bunch of calls, so now I know how to run a successful demo call or a successful discovery call. So what do you recommend to scale up in, in those areas? Yeah, right. Like I've watched a lot of marathons. So clearly <laughs> I, can, I can go run one. And it's like, like that's that's kind of what that's saying, right? It's sort of like, no, I listened and thus I can do. And it's like, yeah. you probably cannot, um, but go ahead and try and see how that goes and, and learn from that as well. And that's sort of what the win back book is, is all about. Um, but I would say simply watching, obviously, doesn't do it. And simply listening doesn't do it. First thing is, do you actually have a sales process? Like as a company, do you have a sales process that is trainable, repeatable, or are a lot of your sellers on tribal knowledge? So like, that's the first question as an organization, which is like, if you have a sales process, your SDRs and BDRs should know it before they're in a position to even be promoted because they're a part of the sales process then. Like if you have a fundamental, this is the way in which we sell Uh, from a new business standpoint, and this is our client lifecycle management, and you have every step and every person panned out, and then you have 
what the end in mind and the objective is for each step of the process, your SDR team is most likely a part of that process. And so first thing I would say is if you have a sales process, that should be a part of the core training for your SDRs so that by the time they move to AE, it's, you know, the sales process, you're going to listen to a couple of calls, you're going to practice a few times, but you've been living in our process for a long time. Um, And for your ramp period, we're going to actually let you try it out. We're going to role play with you. We're going to do whatever we can to make you feel comfortable moving into this next step of it. Um, So that's the first thing that I would say is having kind of that sales process. The other thing is an SDR should be wildly curious. Like they should want to learn things, even if it doesn't apply to their job right now today, because you want them to be growth minded. And I bring up this example because we have um, an SDRB or certification at sales assembly. At the end of all of our certifications, we always prompt for feedback. What did you think? And one of the questions that I always ask very deliberately was, um, what if any session was the least relevant to you? And it's because I am genuinely curious to hear what people say, why they say it. If they say this wasn't relevant because it was wrong, I very much need to lean into that and be like, okay, did we, did we totally screw this up? On the flip side, if they say it was least relevant to me because I don't do that in my job, um, that's when I get curious and I go, but why don't you want to learn that? And for SDR, BDR specifically, there was once that I remember where it was a session on cold calling and this individual left feedback that that session was the least relevant because they do most of their prospecting in email. They were like, so that session wasn't really relevant to me because we don't really cold call. I just do most, you know, email marketing. And so I would say that one probably wasn't applicable to me. Um, and in my mind, I was like, no, shame, no, shame, shame. <laughs> no, like you, you're missing it. You're thinking too simplistically. Like, where's your growth mind? Like mm-hmm. you, you should be able to sit in a, on a revenue operation certification and be like, all of that was relevant because it made me stronger in my role. I either know what you're doing and how it impacts me, or maybe one day I'm going to do that job. And now I know. So mm-hmm. that wild curiosity is also super important. And you should never have an SDR that says, yeah, I don't really need to learn that yet, right? Like I'm not an AE yet, so I don't have to learn that yet. Yes, you do. Or you're behind. Like you're already behind. Day one, you're behind. So like you have to learn it. (laughs) Yeah. So you want the person who's ready to dive into the deep end from the start. Yeah. And not look at their job as like, these are the tasks and and the, you know, these are the skills I have have today. And I'm only going to focus on that. And like objection handling and like, like creating urgency at deep close. Like, I don't have to worry about that. I'm just an SDR. I don't do that. Like that's a big red flag for me. It's like, you should know how to do that now. And I think that further illustrates the point you mentioned earlier that just assuming because they've been on calls, like you said, like just because you've watched a marathon doesn't mean you can run a marathon. And and I'm even thinking about, you know, one of the companies that I'm working with right now, um, they have a, an AE who, who grew to that role recently out of being an SDR. And one of the big things we've been working on is uh, like, they're, they're really good at like having energy and building rapport and like a lot of the processes they're really good at, but without fail, almost every time, not knowing how to secure any next steps and just kind of leaving it to, okay, well, we'll talk about it and we'll get back to you. And then a lot of those never come back around, even though the call seems like it's going well. And that person could have been listening to a hundred calls of how it's done well, but if they don't ever put it in practice or they're not being trained on it in a more structured way, that, that will forever be an issue that they run into and not even necessarily know that they're doing it, you know, or that they could be doing it better. Exactly. Exactly. Like that's like, you've, you've hit the nail on the head with that. Like do do develop the skills for the job that you want to have today, because there's no way, shape or form that it won't make you a stronger professional today. Like I guarantee, I guarantee if you are listening to this, all of your top BDRs and SDRs are top BDRs and SDRs because they are leaning into learning a skill set that is outside of their current job scope. I mean, that's like a hundred percent metric. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's something to that. Well, and th- so uh, I watched a talk, like a recording online of a talk at a, at a conference last year. And I'm, this is terrible because I'm blanking on what the conference was or who the person was delivering it. It was impactful but, and impacted yes. you clearly. Yeah. <laughs> yes. But they, yeah, what they talked about was like how you have different types of employees at your company. And there are the people, like, there's one group where it's like, 
I'm here to punch a clock and that's it. And they're always going to be your like lowest performing people. And you probably, I mean, maybe you have them. Ideally you don't have them as employees, but everyone does. But you also maybe don't invest in their growth if they're not invested in their own growth. Then there's a second set, which is I am uh, like, I'm all into like learning about my job at this company. And that's good. But then the highest performers and the ones you want to cultivate the most and invest in the most are the ones who are saying, I'm all in on this company. I want to know everything under the sun about what it takes not to be good in my role, but what it takes to make our organization run better. And I, and that's the type of person who like sends so-and-so in product an email about, hey, I thought about these things because I heard it on a call, thought you might want to know. They're the person who takes a meeting with, or you know, who, who books a meeting with leadership because they have some ideas about company direction. Doesn't mean you have to listen to them every time, but the people who are thinking like that are the ones who are going to be top performers because they're not just thinking about themselves. They truly are thinking about the company at large. Yes, I could not agree with that more. It's the idea of mastery versus advancement. And you want people always thinking about mastery, but mastery also looks like I am learning skills that are outside of my current role. And like, that's cool. Like reinvent what mastery of your current role looks like. And once yeah. you've achieved mastery, now you're focusing on advancement. Because I think also to your point, you don't want to get that person who is too scatterbrained, who is so focused on like everything, but then like their pipeline is failing and they're not yeah. hitting their targets, but they're like, soldier for the cause and they love it. And that's where you're like, listen, I get the advancement. I love the passion. You're an incredible culture fit, but like we need to focus on mastery with you. Yeah. Like we've got some gaps that we need to fill and that person makes it a little bit easier to identify. Yeah. That's a really good um, sort of asterisk to that statement. So I'm glad you brought that up. And on the point of mastery, this is something I used to talk about years ago with my first business because we did more work around like career development. And I always, the way I've, I've looked at it and what I was talking about then was like, Really think about your career in terms of like what skill set do you care to develop and master ultimately? Because to your point, if mastery is the goal, now you're a craftsman, you're an artisan of this thing, of this trade, if you will. It's not just about like a, a short-term goal or about like a, you know, I, I did this thing, so I'm out. You are constantly thinking about how do I learn more and more and more about everything related to this topic? So I don't know. And, and I don't mean like mastery of like SDR. I mean, like maybe communication is the thing you want to master. Well, if communication is what you, and that's for me, I'm using that because for me personally, like that's how I associate myself is, is I, I want to master communication. And so I look at what are all the different ways people communicate and how do I, how do I use that to make myself better for myself and my company, right? Uh, maybe, I don't know, um, organization is something you're looking to master. Well, now you're looking at what are all the different ways organization comes into play for this company and for myself. And so it's not just about what you see the ops team is doing, but maybe then you're also looking at, hmm, is there a better way I could be making my bed in the morning because I care that much about organization? And there's probably some tidbit I'll get there that's going to influence the way I work. Yeah. Well, what I love about what you're saying is it's, it's, it's making the point that you're finding things that are outside of the box that actually do apply to making you better at what you do every day. And it's like, like the person who thinks about that, that says, you know, what's not in my employee handbook when I started is learning how to do this. But I feel like if, and when I learn how to do that, now I'm going to be a better BDR. And yeah. actually by learning that, I'm also going to be a better AE. And then, holy cow, one day if I want to go into leadership, I'm going to keep this in my pocket because it's going to make me a better leader. It's like a lot of these skills that you have to learn are transferable. So learn them now. I've got one more question and then I want to hit our uh, wrap up. And my question is, Earlier on, I asked you, what's the qualities or the makeup of a successful SDR? And the, the word you came to with that was introspective. Now I want to know is what is the qualities or makeup of a successful AE? Um, all of the things that I said for SDR, but I also think for AE, getting a little bit more quantitative, I think patience is big. Um, curiosity is big. 
low ego and ability to be humble is big. Um, recognizing when change needs to happen and learning how to be adaptable. Um, and then things that I always talk about, which is um, leaning into agility and absorption. This is like a common theme that I talk about, but like as an AE, you have to know when you need to be agile and shift and switch. But sometimes sales is up and down, right? There are months or quarters where you're feeling like you're taking a gut punch. And it's like, your job is to absorb that and make it as painless as possible and get back up on your feet when you can. It's not necessarily to always avoid a punch, like it's going to happen. But when you get punched, what do you do? Like, are you preparing to get punched? Um, so I don't, I don't even know like how you say that, but it's just like prepare to get punched and then like recover, like learn your recovery um, is huge. Let's um, talk, let's, let's go into our wrap up now. First off, where can our listeners find you and where can they learn more about your work in sales assembly at large? Absolutely. So you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, um, it's also, if you go to our How It Works page uh, at www.salesassembly.com, there is an explainer video all about what we do and spoiler alert the cartoon in that video is in fact me and that voiceover is in fact me so it will be literally me talking to you uh, and telling you how to interact with our platform um, and then lastly if you just if you want to hear more if you want to know more or if you want to have any kind of a dialogue with me I am here for it uh, Christina with a ch c-h-r-i-s-t-i-n-a at salesassembly.com and if you're finding her on LinkedIn, I'm sure you might get several. Christina Brady, she's the one with the red hair. The red who hair, one, the white jacket. Who, <laughs> who is one person who you want to shout out? I have to shout out Deborah Senra. Um, she actually was getting a certification today. So I exited out of the certification and came here. Um, she is the she is an SVP at Hierology. She's the uh, SVP of revenue and she's an incredible professional, but the way that she lays out process, culture building, having effective meetings and having effective one-on-ones, I've heard her speak on it a few times. And if this is an area that you're struggling and chances are either you or somebody in your organization is struggling with making the time with your people meaningful in a team or one-on-one capacity, um, talk to Deborah. She is a fantastic leader and deserves a shout out for um, a lot of the thought leadership that she provides in that space. Shout out to Deborah Senray. Um, you know, actually one more thing I wanted to, uh in where can we find you? It totally forgot to tee this up for you, but you host a podcast now. Please tell everyone about this amazing podcast. Oh my gosh, I do. Thank you. I forgot about <laughs> my own podcast because I'm like, I'm in yours right now. Um, but yeah, so my podcast is called Taking the Lead um, and it features the most iconic female revenue leaders in B2B tech. Uh, every couple of weeks we have an episode and we talk about things tactical. We talked about things culturally um, and we have some absolutely incredible um, all female guests. So uh, regardless of your gender, please hone in. There's something for everybody. It's an awesome show and I might need to steal some guests from you sometime. Anytime. All right. Now, based on our conversation today, we'll each give our top one or two lessons or takeaways for the listeners. I'll go first and I'll toss it to you. Um, I think my big thing here uh, that I've taken out of this conversation, and again, the topic was um, making turning an SDR into a successful account executive. I actually think it's kind of what we talked about in the middle portion, which is, well, let's actually back off of that mindset that an SDR must become an AE and have a growth roadmap for them based on their interest, their skill set, and your company needs. That could be anything under the revenue umbrella. And I think if companies focus more on that, they'll probably end up in less situations where they have a bad transfer into an AE of six months of no performance, and then everyone's mad, and then they end up getting fired. Christina, top one or two lessons or takeaways today? Uh, what, what have I learned today? Um, I think my big takeaway is I loved the talk track that you were on when just the idea of because I've watched it or listened to it doesn't mean that I can do it. Um, I want to double tap on that because I think so much training is watch it. Um, and now without any additional support, go do it. I think companies will win if they can connect the dots there. They can connect the dots between you've watched it, now practice it, and then go do it. It's like we miss the practice it. We botch that part. Um, so I think my biggest takeaway today is just 
to remind everyone, even remind myself to, to focus in there. Um, not a lot of people do. And to that point, it's actually why, you know, one of my clients said it best with, you know, something like Gong. Gong's only as good, whatever software you have, it's only as good as your ability to use it. Just, just getting calls recorded does nothing if you're not actively, even not just watching it, but then like having notes in there and feedback and things like that. So yeah. Um, final question for you, Christina, which is how we end every episode on this show. Fill in the blank. Entrepreneurship is blank. Entrepreneurship is earned would be my fill in. Say more on that. <laughs> um, I don't think anybody can wake up one day and say, I'm an entrepreneur now. You have to earn the right to be a leader in any space and a leader in any company. And that comes with proof of concept. It comes with building of mission. It comes with having a desire to, like I talked about in the beginning, massively improve the lives of your company and your customers and your employee. Uh, it has to come with the ability to fail. And you have to have the mindset that as an entrepreneur, I bend, I don't break. Um, and a lot of people try to get there without earning it, um, earning it by making a difference, earning it by making mistakes, earning it by leading by example, and earning it by lifting other people up. Um, a lot of entrepreneurs think I am at the top of the chain right now, and that is it. But the best executive leaders I know will lift up 10 people before they will take one step up. Uh, so I think entrepreneurship is earned. Entrepreneurship is earned. You heard it here first. She is Christina Brady, president of Sales Assembly. Christina, thank you so much for joining today on Startup Hitman, the podcast. Thank you for having me. This has been a wonderful conversation and lots of fun. I appreciate it. That wraps up today's conversation. Did you like what you heard? Startup Hype Man, the podcast is available on every major platform, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, and more. So be sure to subscribe on your platform of choice and leave a rating and review. Do you want to be an upcoming guest on the show? Email media at startuphypeman.com with your idea and my team will review. Our theme song is Change the Game by Jay-Z, all rights owned by Rockefeller and Def Jam Records. And hey, if you want to work together on making your startup story the only one that matters, email me at rajiv at startuphypeman.com. That's R-A-J-I-V at startuphypeman.com. Well, that'll do it for today. Thank you for listening. Thank you to today's guests for joining. You have been checking out Startup Hype Man, the podcast. I'll catch you next week. But in the meantime, word up, raise up.